What's up you guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm gonna show you how to incorporate some realistic physics into your Pi game games using Python code. So I'm really excited to bring you guys this tutorial. Obviously we do a lot of Pi game content on this channel and a lot of full uh, games where we build them out start to finish. And sometimes I sort of gloss over elements like collision detection or gravity um, in those videos. And then also sometimes I don't really uh, incorporate things like friction or bouncing off the walls. So I just wanna make this a generic tutorial on how to incorporate several elements of realistic uh, physics into your Pi game games. So we're going to start with gravity, which is probably the easiest element here. Um, we're going to create a class for balls so that we can create some different uh, balls like you can see on screen that have different properties like different amounts of lost energy and velocity when you drop them. And then also um, we're going to take a look at how to kind of grab and throw which you've seen me do on uh, the screen here. I can grab any of these balls and sort of throw them in any direction I want. And you'll notice it, that actually how hard I throw the ball um, directly correlates with how fast it moves in the X and Y direction. So we're gonna take a look at throwing objects and then you can clearly see they bounce off of the walls, they bounce off the floor. I do let them go through the ceiling but using this tutorial you'll know how to make them bounce off the ceiling too if you so choose. Um, and one thing you may not have noticed because it's a little more subtle, but they actually slow down in both the X direction and the Y direction. And so to do this, we're going to simulate essentially an imperfect bounce, right? Like a minor loss of energy, like you'd get if you dropped a golf ball or a bouncy ball on the ground, you would see the ball not bounce all the way back to its uh, original starting spot. So we're going to make that uh, something to play around with. And then we're also going to incorporate kind of a coefficient of friction so that when the balls are rolling along um, on the floor, they slow down because they're also imperfect. There's friction there. So we have a lot of concepts to cover. We're gonna do them one at a time and I'm gonna make the chapters titled each concept as we go. So if you don't really need gravity, you just wanna know how to handle like throwing an object, then you can go there. If you just wanna know how to handle friction, you can go there. Be sure to let me know in the comments below what you think of this video, what you'd like to see more of on the channel. Don't forget to leave a like on the video. And I have been doing a, uh, just started a kind of silly personal channel that's still engineering concepts, but less education, more fun. That'll be linked below as well. And of course, the code you see in this tutorial will be at a link in the GitHub, uh, also below in the description section of this video. So without any further ado, let's get right into the tutorial. So as always, and it shouldn't be any uh, surprise at this point, but you want to import Pygame and do pygame.init as your first two lines in any Pygame game. Uh, import Pygame, if you don't have the package installed, just run pip install Pygame. And then we're going to pick a width of 1000, 1000, and a height of 800. We're gonna store those in variables because we'll use them at a few points for like collision detection and stuff. And then let's just set up that our screen is going to be pygame.display.setMode like that. And then in square brackets, our width variable and our height variable, okay? So that is just the basic defining of the outer screen dimensions in a Pi game game. And then let's say that we want to run at an FPS of 60, so 60 frames per second. And we're going to initialize a Pi game timer that we're gonna to use to control the speed of the game by doing pygame.time.clock with a capital C, just like that. And then we'll have a section below that where uh, when it comes time as we're building this, we'll put like a game variables library down here but we're not gonna fill that out just too much because now we're going to set up the main game loop, okay? And to do this, we're just gonna create a variable called run and we're gonna set it equal to true. And then we're gonna do a few basic things every single loop of the game. So while run, while that loop is true, first thing we're gonna do is timer.tick at our frame rate. And then let's just screen.fill with whatever color you want the background to be. I'm gonna use black because it makes all of the colored balls that I'll use um, kind of pop against the black background. But you can put whatever, uh, whatever um, background color or image you want right there. 
And then a uh, basic thing, kind of the last step in setting up the game loop is for event in pygame.event.get. And so this command is how we get everything happening with our computer on the mouse, the keyboard, anything else. It's for event in pygame.event.get. And we need to check if this specific one, if event.type is equal to pygame.quit, all caps like that. And that is checking to see if the red X button in the toolbar is pressed. So if that's pressed, then we want run to be set equal to false, just like that. Um, and that's all we're gonna do for game handling now. We will come back to that when we're taking a look at like throwing balls. Um, but so then just come outside of your event handling and add pygame.display.flip like this. And then outside of the while loop, we want pygame.quit. So this means as long as we haven't hit the quit button, run will not be false. So we are going to flip everything onto the screen, draw it onto the screen while run is true. But then once we press the quit button, run will be equal to false and it will execute this line of code, which will end the program. So this should be all we need to do to get a black rectangle of 1000 pixels wide, 800 pixels tall, just like that. And now we can start building things out in our game, which is great. Uh, and the first thing I want to do, it's not the most glamorous thing we're gonna do in this tutorial, but uh, it's important is I just want to draw some walls so it's really clear where the edges are. I know I use dark mode and pie charm. Um, and we're, so we're gonna use the walls just kind of as visual indication when we hit things. So uh, this is gonna be really fast, bear with me, and it's kind of important. And it honestly, it's a stylistic uh, improvement. So we'll just define draw walls here, and it's gonna be a quick, easy little wall drawing function. And it's just gonna be our left wall is gonna be pygame.draw.line, and we're gonna put it on the screen, and I'm gonna make it a white line so it really pops against a black background. And then this is going to be the left wall. So we want to start at position zero, zero. So X and Y are zero. And then it's a line. So we need to just give it start and stop points. And it's going to go X. So still zero along the left edge, but all the way down to the full height of our screen. And then uh, instead of defining, uh, instead of typing like a 10 for wall thickness, like four times for each wall, I'm gonna put that in a variable so that this is kind of the first thing where if you want to play around with your game settings and make it look different, um, you don't have to have that be 10, but I'm gonna be using that you know, four times here. So it's just a little faster if I decide I wanna change it later um, to put it in a variable. So then we're gonna have a left wall, a right wall, a top wall and a bottom wall and I got to fix that indentation there we go and a bottom wall and you have to be very careful about your start and stop points for all of these um, because like the top wall will be starting at um, whoop, did I type that wrong nope starting at the same spot so zero zero but then it's going to go across the screen to the full width of the screen and then it's going to be um, still at the top, so zero. Whereas like the bottom one will start and stop at the full height of the screen, which is at the very bottom, um, and go across it from zero to the full width. So uh, then the right wall will be at width the whole time. So all the way on the right edge of the screen the whole time. And I think I'm missing maybe a close parentheses on one of these, let's see. Um, yeah, I am missing a parentheses. So let's just uh, close it out, I guess. That should do it. Um, actually, I think the issue is that I shouldn't have a starting parentheses over there, so I think we're okay. Yeah, no errors. <laughs> All right, sorry about the distraction. I promised this was gonna be easy. Wall list equals left, right, top, bottom. Okay, so um, honestly, I don't think anything we're gonna do in this tutorial will specifically require you to go through this entire list, um, but it is nice to have somewhere really easy to find that you're drawing all of the walls so that if you have a point where you wanna just check for any collision in the game, you can. And now if we boot that up, you're gonna see there's this nice white frame around the game board and that's what we'll kind of use for detecting if we've hit the left or the right or the bottom um, or if we've gone off screen to the top if we decide to do anything for that. 
And now we're gonna get into the absolute meat of this project, which is um, we want to make code that works for any object we drop into it. So uh, we wanna make a class essentially where we only have to write the code once to determine how a ball is going to interact in our game. That's sort of the essence of like, game engines and physics engines is these laws and this code that you write apply to any shape that you draw in. And so this class that we're gonna make is going to be a ball class. So let's come up here and it's a ball with a capital B and then that's really just a syntactic thing but it's the correct way to define a class in Python. Um, and then the first thing we're gonna do is def underscore underscore init underscore underscore and then we give it all of the variables that it's going to see um, that it needs to have as part of the class. So if you think about what could fully define a ball, it would be its X position, its Y position, uh, its radius, its color, um, how much mass it has if we were doing like a, colli a collision calculation for conservation of momentum. Um, so then uh, of retention, so this is something we're gonna talk about when we talk about loss in bounces, but so like every time a ball bounces, it's not perfectly returning to the destination that it just was, unless you want it that way. So we'll create a calculatable um, retention variable that you can change and play around with. And then it'll need a speed in the X and the Y direction. And then uh, we'll give each ball a unique um, ball ID. You can call this whatever you want, um, but we're gonna give each ball an ID. And then you have to do this interesting thing for um, classes in Python, where if you want to use uh, these variables that you just passed in inside your sub functions in the class, you need to do a self dot basically the same variable name for every variable. You can make it different if you want, like you could say self.rad equals radius if you're gonna remember uh, what rad stands for. But it's pretty easy to just go through and say self.whatever is equal to every um, variable. So we're just gonna do that quickly here. Self.mass is mass, self.retention is retention, retention, there we go. Self dot y uh, speed is equal to y speed. Self dot x speed equal to x speed. And self dot seld, self dot id is equal to id, okay? And so we're gonna use all of these things in our subsequent functions. Um, to sort of uh, handle all of this code that we would want so that we only need to define it once. And if we wanna make 10 balls or 50 balls, we're really saving time because we've written driver code that's gonna tell all balls how to interact in our world here with the physics rules we give it. So um, first thing and easiest thing that we'll wanna do is gonna be draw it, okay? So we're gonna say, let's make it visible. That'll kind of be how we do all of our troubleshooting. So we're making this uh, class function now. And uh, essentially you'll see, maybe you saw, when I did define and then a function called draw, uh, it populates with the parameter self. That's essentially saying, let me inherit all of these variables so that I can reference them in here. So any function in a class is typically gonna have self passed in as well as extra parameters if you need to pass them in, we don't here. So we're gonna have a new variable that we'll call self.circle, and you have to instantiate all your variables in this init function. So it's okay to just leave it essentially as a blank and then overwrite it as soon as we do the define uh, draw. And what we'll do is self.circle is equal to pygame.draw.circle like this. And then we're gonna put it on the screen and then we're going to make it self.color, so whatever color it was passed in. And then for its uh, center point, it'll just be self.xpause comma self.y pause, uh, y position. So that's gonna be its kind of x and y center. And then for its radius, just self.radius, okay? Just like this. So that is a fully defined circle. It uh, goes on screen, this color, this position, and this radius, okay? So that is all we have to do to draw it. 
um, which is great, but we haven't actually defined any instances of this class, right? So let's go ahead and do that to talk about creating an instance of a class. So let's just say we want to make ball one and we want to be equal to ball with a capital B, that's our class. So we need to give it an X starting position and I'll say 50, a Y starting position, I'll also say 50. A radius, we'll say 30, so it's easy enough to see. Um, a color, we'll make this one blue. And then a mass, we're gonna make it 100. We're not gonna use that for a little while here. A retention, so this is interesting. Let's just go ahead and say 0.9, right? So 90% of its bounce value will it retain. Um, and that'll be useful once we get gravity and bouncing incorporated. Okay, so we have 0.9 and then we need to give it a X speed and Y speed, I believe, and then we said ID. And so this is our first ball, we'll just make it ball one, okay? And you'll notice I actually instantiated it outside, I called it, initialized it outside of the main game loop. And that's because we're going to just define the initial ball once, but then we're going to change a lot of those initial values with our functions inside the game loop. So all you need to do out there is call the origination of the, of the ball. If you actually were to do that inside your game loop, even if you tried to change some of those variables, it would get overwritten. Okay, so then down here, we'll come down here and just say ball one dot draw. Okay, so now what I should have, because we haven't built any movement into the game. Yeah, I have this light blue, uh, I guess regular royal blue uh, ball on the screen at position 50, 50, radius 30, okay? So that's kind of cool, but uh, just that on its own, not that impressive because it would take uh, far less time and less lines of code than we just put in to just pi game dot draw circle blue th radius 30 right there, right? But here's where it starts getting a little more powerful is if we were to make ball two, and now it's gonna be at 500, 500 that it starts. This will have a radius of 50, and we'll make this one, this bigger one, uh, green, and we'll give it a mass of 300. Again, just picking a value. A lower retention value of 0.8 for this one, and then zero, zero, and an ID of two, okay? If I come down here and I say ball two dot draw, just with basically defining the ball here and then calling its draw function here, what you'll see is we now get a second ball on the screen. So this is great, right? We have ball one and ball two. Now let's take a look at incorporating gravity into our class so that we don't have to do some code that we repeat for uh, every single ball. It's just going to be built into the sort of um, logic underlying the ball class. It knows if I'm a ball and I'm hanging in air, then I need to fall, right? So let's define this function that we'll call check gravity, all right? Basically check my position in space and determine what I should do based on that. And so what we'll do is we'll start by saying if self dot y pause, so that variable we called in the init function, if self dot y pause is less than, meaning uh, in air basically. So the way pi game coordinates work is the higher numbers are closer to the bottom of the screen. So if your game is 800 pixels tall, pixel zero in the y direction is actually at the very top and 800 is at the very bottom. So the way we check if our ball is in air, we check if the y position is less than the height of the screen, but then we also need to say minus self dot radius because uh, we wanna check if the edges are colliding with the bottom, um, which basically means that the center point, so the y position plus the radius has to be on top of the uh, height. But then the way wall, walls work, um, is we also have to incorporate that wall thickness we defined divided by two because uh, we defined a line that's exactly at the bottom of the screen, but then we made it 10 wide, which means that there's actually five pixels above it and five pixels below it. So um, we're just gonna use wall thickness minus two. But essentially, if Y position is less than all, all of those combined, that means we are in air, okay? So that means that we need self dot Y speed and we need to essentially increase our speed which is actually going to be uh, plus equals so that means add to myself a value of what well we need to make a game variable that we'll call gravity okay so we'll come up to our game variable section um, and we'll define gravity here 
And this is kind of the first opportunity to do some guess and check and see what like works for your game the way you want it to work. Uh, I think that a gravity of 0.5 is very good for an application running at 60 FPS. It feels fairly realistic, um, fairly similar to what you'd expect to see. Uh, but feel free to increase this, decrease this, see how that kind of changes the bounces. Um, but so basically moving on from uh, that, we have this gravity variable, but what do we do if we are not um, in air? Okay, so if we've hit the ground essentially, um, then we wanna say else, and then we'll check if self dot y speed is greater than a new variable we're gonna have to make that'll be basically saying bounce stop, okay? So um, this is a pretty important step because um, we don't want it to do infinite tiny little bounces forever. We kind of want a variable that's just gonna say, you know what, these bounces have gotten negligible and rather than have this silly looking infinitely bouncing and decreasing thing on the screen, we're gonna say, you know what, if my total speed is less than 0.3, I'm just gonna stop, okay? And again, guess and check on all of these game variables. That's why we're putting them there so you can play around with what makes sense for you. But what you'll see is this will actually be nice. It'll give us a point where the ball will just stop bouncing, okay? So if my Y speed as I'm going down is still great enough that I want to continue bouncing, then I want to set self dot Y speed equal to, again, my previous value, which was self dot y speed, y speed, there we go. Um, but now times negative one, so this is flipping the direction. So if it was just falling down, it's gonna start going upward, but then we want to incorporate that retention value we made, right? So make sure when you generate your balls, if you're doing whatever physics application you're doing, similar to this, make sure that that retention value is between zero and one. So anything more than one, and you'd actually be generating energy on every bounce, I guess you can do that. Um, but so like a value of one here would mean we're getting a perfect bounce every time. It'll take off upward with as much speed as it was coming downward with. Um, that's not how real life works. So uh, I always use values between like 0.5 for a really bad bounce or like 0.9 for a solid bounce. Um, okay, but so then we need to do one more check because we just sent it upward, um, but we also need to check else if, and now the absolute value of self dot y speed, um, because remember it's directional, so it could be up or down. And if it's less than or equal to bounce stop, then we want self dot y speed to just be equal to zero. Um, and this is actually really important uh, extra step because we could have a situation here where self dot y speed is less than bounce stop, but it's less than bounce stop um, because it's like negative 20, right? Which is actually quite a bit of speed. It's just heading upwards. Um, and so this will catch that scenario and it'll only actually stop a bounce if the absolute value of Y speed has gotten slow enough to stop a bounce, okay? Um, so I hope I didn't lose you guys there. I hope this makes sense. What you should see now is just we boot this up and we get two balls bouncing with gravity. Oh, we didn't move it yet. <laughs> um, you do have to call a function. So like this nice check gravity function we just wrote, we have to come down where we do our ball dot uh, draw and we have to call these functions. So we need to say ball one dot check gravity and then ball two dot check gravity. So you, when you generate a new function, you just need to remember to call that function. Um, and I'm gonna stop forgetting things now, I promise. Um, if you're going to update something inside of these functions, you need to uh, essentially return it so that you can remember what your previous speed was, okay? So we need to return y speed from this, self dot y speed from this so that we can keep a running tally of what our self dot y speed is. And uh, we also have to update our position based on the y speed. So um, let's come back down here. And uh, so now ball one dot y speed will be equal to 
checking gravity for ball one. So ball one dot y speed is equal to this and ball two dot y speed is equal to this. But it's great, we're increasing the speed, but we're not moving the ball yet. So uh, that's actually something I'm very surprised I forgot to do. But we'll go ahead and make another function that we'll call ball one dot update underscore position and ball two dot update underscore position. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at creating the not just the check gravity function, but the update underscore position function. Okay. Uh, and so uh, I promise it's actually gravity is going to be the hardest thing for us to do because we're setting up a lot of initial things here that don't specifically refer to gravity. They refer to our game writ large, but uh, this is still a really important step. So for updating the position, what we want to do is say self dot y position plus equals self dot y speed. And it's okay here to say that we're going to do self dot x position plus equals self dot x speed as well. We just obviously haven't done anything with x speed yet. So you don't really have to worry about that too much just yet. But now Fingers crossed, uh, cross your fingers for me too. But when we boot this up, we should get these balls. Yeah, you can see them falling and bouncing. And hopefully you can see this ball will stop bouncing unless I made the retention too high. It might be exactly at 0.5. Oh, that's so frustrating. All right, let's go to the green ball uh, and let's make it a 0.9 retention. All right, let's check that out. We may have had a situation where that ball was going to bounce exactly to 0.5 because of rounding forever. All right, but so you see these guys are bouncing a whole bunch of times and there, yeah, the green ball actually stopped bouncing and now our blue one is still bouncing, but very small and now it's come to a complete rest. So this is great and you can play around with some of these things uh, like retention at this point now. So if I were to make a uh, blue 0.5 and green 0.3, you'll just see two balls that just barely bounce. I mean, they, right, they, they go upwards with 30 and 50% of the speed they just had. So this is kind of why values of like 0 0.8, 0 0.9 are nice for balls. Um, but so that's great for gravity. And just again, to reiterate the power of what we're doing here by putting it in a class and how you can make your games really robust by putting your objects in classes is you write this code once and as long as you write a set of behaviors that would need to be true for any of these objects, you get to just repeat it and we can define another ball simply by just putting in here uh, the same instantiating like line of code. So purple, um, this one I guess, can make, it can be 200, it doesn't really matter. We'll make it 0.8 and then this is gonna be ID three. So just by doing that and then making sure that you add in the ball three dot draw, okay, ball three dot update position and then ball three dot Y speed is equal to ball three dot check gravity. Okay. So just by those simple lines of code, I get this other ball, this pink ball now that's also bouncing with its own set of rules and it's still obeying gravity and all of that jazz, just because we correctly built a class that can handle infinite objects, essentially infinite objects. Okay. So that is going to be the summary on gravity. Now we're going to move into, I think the best next thing to do will be um, essentially throwing your objects. So uh, how do we select a ball? And then how do we essentially get the vector that the mouse is moving in so we know what general direction to move the ball in? Okay, and so to do this, we're gonna do a little bit more in our event handling. So we're gonna make a new if event.type, and this time we're going to check if the mouse is pressed. So pygame.mouse button down, all caps like that. And then what we want to do is we basically want to check if the ball was selected based on the ball's uh, collision with a point. So to do that, we're going to make a new function and we'll say if ball one dot check underscore select um, for our event dot position. So we'll want to pass into the check select function we're about to make the position of the mouse when it clicked, okay? 
Um, and so one thing to note that I think is important here, you can change this if you want. I just want to uh, essentially check this code if the event.button is equal to one. So this is the left keyboard click, uh, the left mouse click. So you can make this for any of the buttons if you want. I just wanna say if the left mouse was clicked, then I wanna check my balls. So if ball one or ball two dot check select, and this will just be a true false to check whether or not we have clicked on um, that specific ball. So we'll do it for each ball or ball three dot check underscore select boy i'm having a hard time typing the word select and then pass event dot position in for all of them okay so i obviously have some pretty big text on right here so that everyone can see all of the code but hopefully uh that doesn't confuse or throw an error let's see it might because it doesn't like my backslash all right so uh there's gonna be a little bit off screen here but it's just an or ball three dot check select and what we're going to do if any of those are true then we'll make an active selection variable equal to true okay so just something that says hey you have selected a ball and then we'll make a counter to this check which is if event dot type is equal to pi game dot mouse button up and we need some code that is basically going to say if the event dot button was equal to one again, um, then I want to release whatever I had actively selected, but also we need to essentially set that check select variable back equal to uh, false. And so to do that, we can just say for J in range or for I in range is fine, for I in range, and then the length of uh, all of our balls. So this is something new that we can use for a lot of different smart stuff. But if we come up here and we make a balls list, um, I know I'm saying balls a lot in this video, <laughs> but if we make a list of all of the balls uh, that we've created in our game and we have some thing that we wanna check for all of them, we can say for I in range the length of that list of balls that we just created, then uh, why don't we just run that uh, check select? So balls at I dot check select. The, this function, let's run it with a point that couldn't possibly be true. So um, it's okay to put like a nonsense value in here. You could write another function that's basically like release select, but since we're going to be writing a check select function to see if the mouse is grabbing somewhere in collision with that ball, we might as well just write a function that's going to be impossible because it has uh, negative coordinates. And so I think I need to stop talking about the check select function until we write the check select function. So let's go ahead and do that. It's not gonna be very difficult. It's just a few lines of code to say within the ball class, hey, I've just been told I need to check and see if the mouse selected me. So define check underscore select, we've been calling it. And then itself, and here's our first example of passing in an additional parameter, and this one is going to be the position. So the X and Y coordinate of the mouse when it just clicked the button. All right, and so here we'll make a variable called self.selected, and we'll say it's equal to false. Okay, so uh, we're going to say by default, I'm going to assume that I'm not selected and then force this function to prove me wrong. And so uh, obviously when we wanna make a new function, a new variable inside a class, make sure you instantiate in the beginning as well. But now what we'll say is, okay, self.selected starts out false, but then if self.circle, so the circle that I'm already drawing, if it has this dot collide point, which is a Pygame built-in collision detection tool with the position, so the event uh, position that the mouse just clicked on, then we want to make self dot selected equal to true, okay? So this is uh, great. This is saying um, now I have a way of checking whether or not I am selected, and then we're going to return that self.selected value to basically tell the outside world, yes, I got a ball, or no, I still haven't gotten a ball, okay? 
And so what we need to do is actually with this um, mouse position, we need to come into our update position and say, well, if I am selected, so if I'm not selected, then I want to keep doing what we've already defined. So if not self dot selected, then I want to keep doing these things. But what should we do if we have been selected? Well, we're still updating the X and Y position, but this means that we're dragging the ball around with us. So self dot X position and self dot Y position need to be equal to mouse coordinates. And so what that means is we need to go back into the outside world and we need to make our mouse coordinates something that we pass into our update, uh, our update position function so that we basically still pass in the X and Y coordinates of the mouse and when we are selected we want to update the position to whatever position the mouse is currently dragging us to um, and this is actually surprisingly simple uh, so let's go ahead and go back into our main game loop and let's just say right under our screen dot fill that we'll make a variable called mouse coords and it's going to be equal to pygame dot mouse dot get position okay so it really is just as simple as that and then we come down to our update position function and we're going to pass in the mouse cords to all three of those so I might be skipping some steps I hope I'm not if I am we'll fix it but hopefully this will let me drag a ball around yeah with the mouse which is awesome but what you'll see when I release it is uh, it kind of does some funky business it doesn't really um, it doesn't really grasp uh, <laughs> proper modes of movement and the reason for this is you can take something that was on its way down really close to about to hit the ground and uh, you can drag it way up in the air so like if you can catch something with a pretty high downward velocity and then drag it up it's gonna fall really fast so uh, to handle this, we essentially need to figure out what to do when we release it from a selection. So um, what we want to do now is uh, make some new code in the check gravity function, uh, check gravity function that will handle the difference between what to do when selected and not selected. So if not selected, then we want, again, everything we already defined. That's great, you're, you're moving the way we want you to move and everything else, so keep it up. Um, but if we are selected, else, if we have been selected, then we need to sort of reset these. And so initially, let's just say self.x speed is zero, self.y speed is zero okay so this just means I've grabbed the ball reset the downward speed so that if I grab this green ball right before it hits the ground and then I drag it up here it'll start falling from zero again so essentially it resets the memory of this um, which is a cool it's a cool way to essentially drag something and drop something which is a good start um, but what you'll notice is if I like wing something if I like throw it really hard it does not stop uh, it does not get momentum because I moved the mouse really fast it does not get thrown essentially it just gets sort of moved um, so to do that we want to come up with a way of figuring out what the actual push from the mouse is so X push and Y push are going to be these variables I want to make next that essentially are going to be uh, calculated by the uh, motion vector of the mouse. So to do this, this X push and Y push, we have to come up to our game variables and we have to make a new track positions of mouse to get movement vector, right? And I say vector because it needs to have speed and direction. So mouse trajectory is going to be essentially an empty list of uh, positions all right and then what we're going to do is once we boot up the game right below getting the mouse coordinates so right underneath mouse cords get position we're going to get uh, the position and add it to our mouse trajectory list so mouse underscore trajectory dot append and then the mouse coordinates and again, you can play around with this next bit if you want, but what I'm gonna say is if the length 
of my mouse trajectory list has gotten above 20. So that's gonna be one third of a second, right? If you're running at 60 frames per second, then if your list has gotten to 20, you know what your mouse did in the last third of a second, which is enough to know the direction it was moving and the speed it was moving at when you released the ball. Feel free to extend this out if you want it to be the whole previous second, you could make it a 60. But basically what I'm gonna say is I don't want this to be um, longer than 20, and I want essentially a first in, first out mechanism. So I'm gonna pop whatever the first position is in my list. List. And then I'm going to say X push and Y push. So those variables I'm looking to get from the mouse are going to be equal to calculate the motion. Uh, let's just say vector. So it's crystal clear. Okay. And this is not one that gets done inside the ball class. This is sort of like draw walls. It's just its own free floating uh, function here. So what we'll do is we'll say define and then calc underscore motion underscore vector. And we're gonna return, uh, we won't call them push inside of this function, we'll call them y speed and x speed. Um, but what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna say x speed equals zero and y speed equals zero to start, just because if the list is empty, like the very first time we boot it up, this won't work. So what we'll say is if the length of mouse trajectory is greater than 10. Um, so that means essentially it's half populated at least. So the fastest you can throw a ball would be in the first uh, one sixth of a second. That should be enough time, but uh, you can play around with these values if you need to. What I wanna do is actually pretty simple. I'm not gonna care about like all the data in the middle. I'm gonna take the position the mouse was in t uh, at the first frame in my list water break. And then the position that the mouse was in at the last frame in my list, I'm going to divide it by 20. So actually, I think what I'll say is greater than 19. So that means fully populated. Uh, then what I want to do is say that the mouse trajectory at position minus one, zero, minus the mouse trajectory at zero, zero, uh, and then divide it by the length of the list. So divided by length of mouse trajectory. And actually 10 is fine because this will sort of scale. If there's only 10 in the list, it'll divide by 10. If it's uh, 20 in the list, it'll divide by 20. So let's keep it that way. And let's do the same thing for the Y coordinates. Just all these second zeros need to be ones. And so mouse trajectory, again, is a list of coordinates. So every individual index in that list um, is going to have an X in the zero index and then a Y in the one index. And then the first position that the mouse uh, was in, so essentially a third of a second ago, will be in position zero. And then the last position our mouse got to will be in minus one. So this is one from the back. And that's all we need to do to calculate the X and Y speed that our mouse was moving at when we uh, threw the ball. So now we should be calculating this X push and Y push, um, but the savvy viewer will remember, let's see what happens here. If I grab this and throw it upward, you'll see that ball's not coming back. <laughs> um, the the uh, Y movement actually looks really good, but we have not done anything to essentially handle X collision off of the sidewalls. So we need to do that. And the best place to do that is gonna be in our um, check gravity and update function, our update position functions. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually, we're gonna leave update position alone because that's pretty much golden and simple right there. And check gravity is sort of a more complicated place. It should probably be called check collisions or check movement, but I called it check gravity, so we've gone too far. Alrighty, let's come down below our uh, else absolute value, essentially, but still inside of the if not selected. Um, and we'll say if now self.x position, and we're gonna do some checking similar to what we did for floor collision. So if the x position is less than the combination of my whoop, the combination of my radius plus the wall thickness divided by two, this means that I have collided with the left wall. Okay, but 
to be really robust, we want to put in here an and self.x speed is negative. Because if the x speed is positive, that means I'm already going in the right direction. So I don't want to flip it again. Like in the case where you get a very high speed and then you flip direction on collision, you might not clear that collision with your very first scan, um, even by flipping the speed. So you would want to make it to where you only flip direction if you're moving in the wrong direction. In other words, if you collide with the left wall, but you're trying to move right, it doesn't make sense to invert the uh, x direction here. Okay, so then we'll say or, these are gonna be the two scenarios where we might need to um, invert a uh, x direction. It's basically collision with the left wall or collision with the right wall. And that would be if our x position is greater than the width minus self dot radius minus half the wall thickness. So wall thickness divided by two, just like that. And self dot x speed greater than zero, just like that, okay? Uh, and so if either of these two things are true, then we wanna set self dot x speed equal to its inverse. So basically times equals self dot x speed. Come on, Pete, think. Uh, times equals. So it's set equal to itself times negative one. And then just a cool way to make it slow down on collisions is that same retention value that we already made. Let's slow it down in the x direction as well. So this is gonna handle left and right bounces. It's basically going to flip the direction and bounce you off the left and right walls, but with a speed that is proportional to how fast it was going and losing a little bit of that speed due to the retention uh, factor, okay? Now what we wanna do is we wanna say unless, similar to the y direction, if self.x speed is less than that bounce stop variable that we said is like, hey, I'm not going fast enough to bounce off the wall, then I want to set self.x speed equal to zero, okay? And now let's go ahead and take a look at what to do with friction, okay? So let's say we're still moving in the x direction, but the y has stopped bouncing. So if self dot y speed is equal to, is equal to zero, and self dot x speed is not equal to zero, so we haven't stopped moving in the x direction, if self dot x speed is greater than zero, then we want to slow it down using friction. So self dot x speed minus equals self dot friction, okay? And I know I'm just throwing friction at you, but we're here in the x direction movement scenarios. We've just handled bouncing off the walls, so we may as well incorporate uh, how to slow the ball down if it's no longer rolling. So we have this new self dot friction, friction equals uh, friction, okay? So we want to pass in something else after ID that we'll call friction. And I'm not gonna lie to you guys, to get a smooth, pleasant roll, you actually want friction to be like a very small value. So I have found when I defined my balls, and again, you can define it however you want, but I found 0.02 and 0.03 to kind of be the sweet spot for slowing down while rolling. You'll see here the purple ball well, you'll probably see here, the purple ball, once it stops bouncing vertically, is going to coast to a stop much slower than even feels natural for like a ball. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But so again, the friction variable is just another thing you can play with to sort of see how it uh, moves these balls. But what we're saying is if the X speed and the Y speed are, um, are, x speed and y speed are not zero, then we want to slow down the x speed. Uh, but it's not as simple as checking to see if the x speed is greater than zero. We also need an else, um, l if self dot x speed is 
less than zero, right? Because our velocity has direction. It matters which way it's moving. If it's super large and negative, it still needs to get slowed down by friction. It's just now self dot x speed plus equal self dot friction. So every time it hits a wall, the value of x speed is going to change between positive and negative. And so we need to continually decrease it and bring that value closer to zero with friction. And we do that with these four lines of code, okay? And so that was a bit of a crash course in friction and we certainly didn't use like the official coefficient of friction formula, but that's kind of boring. You guys would have been bored by that anyways. So let's go ahead and boot this up and take a look at what we've just done because we actually haven't run this since we had wall collision. And you can see that looks pretty good. The wall collision looks really good actually. And what you hopefully can tell uh, just from the screen recording is the faster I, oh, I actually just chucked it off screen, there it is. Uh, the faster I move my mouse, the uh, faster it moves when I release it. So I can take like the blue ball here and I can give it a really gentle toss um, or I can take the purple ball and I can just chuck it upwards and it's gonna come back, but it's gonna take a while, all right? And now you can see this green ball is slowing down. It's still bouncing vertically, um, but it is slowing down. I think it had a really good retention. And now it's gonna stop bouncing vertically and friction is gonna get to coast to a stop pretty quick. Same with the purple ball there. Okay, so we have friction, which is awesome. We have bouncing, which is terrific. Uh, we have wall collision, we have gravity, and we have the ability to grab these balls and throw them uh, all over the screen. So this may have seemed like a little bit of a hectic tutorial. I haven't really shown you how to build a game per se, just a lot of game mechanics. But if you fully understand every concept that we're doing in this tutorial, you're going to be able to build some very realistic physics movements in your games. And it also means you're getting a pretty good grasp on what's possible using Python classes, which is so important for any object-oriented programming language um, to understand the power of classes, which is basically generating objects, which is sort of the whole point of object-oriented programming as I understand it. So let's go ahead and throw one more ball in here. Let's just make a red one just to, again, reiterate how powerful this thing is. Um, to, all that code that we've written to just immediately be able to apply it to another ball. We'll say this one's gonna be red and let's make it our largest ball yet. Uh, let's give it a pretty bad retention, 0 0.7, zero and zero for initial X and Y speeds. Uh, ID four, and then for friction, let's say like 0.1. So the red ball, you should see going to coast basically to a stop as soon as uh, it stops bouncing vertically. And the reason we only apply friction while we are not bouncing vertically is because when you are leaving the ground, there's not as much air friction as there is between like floor and ball. So it's just a preference thing. Uh, if you really want to figure out like an air drag friction uh, for while it's in the air, you know, totally go ahead. But it sounds like you already know a thing or two about physics. So maybe you don't need this beginner physics tutorial. Um, but do, do, do. Uh, just by going in every place that we call the balls and we add our ball four to all of the logic event dot pause event dot pause and actually you pr you should probably go through and do a for loop similar to this for the uh, event dot pause and essentially set active select uh, equal to true um, if it's uh, true so you could do that um, we're, we're pretty late in this tutorial it's been a full hour and I just wanted to cover some basic physics concepts let's check out uh, our red ball see if we add everything so you can see it actually you know what a fun experiment would be I'm gonna drop them all from the same uh, Y position so Y of let's say uh, 100 no let's say 50 just to get a lot of height uh, I'm gonna drop them all from 50 and looking at the difference between 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and uh, I'll make the blue one 0.95. So the blue one should bounce forever. The green one probably second as long. Uh, red will stop quite a bit faster. So if I boot these all up, 
you'll see they bounce pretty much in sync, but you can see the height difference as well as the frequency difference between when they come up and come down. So there's really no comparison. Like if you start tweaking these retention values, you're gonna see sort of the physics effect you're hoping to get. Uh, and it actually, it applies for X direction too. So like, even if I throw the red ball pretty hard in the X direction, every time it hits that wall, it slows down in the X direction a lot. And then as soon as it stops uh, going vertically, it's really done. And you can see our blue ball was still bouncing from the initial uh, drop and then if I chuck it horizontally like that it is gonna bounce in almost that exact same shape for a really long time because it's maintaining so much of its energy um, so the core concept and if I were to do a, com a continuation of this project if at some point in the future you guys want to see like advanced physics be sure to let me know in the comments below but what's going on with both retention and friction as well as gravity is essentially um, conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. So if we were to put in ball to ball collision here as well, so if any ball were to hit any other ball, we would want it to essentially know how to react using realistic momentum and energy. That's some pretty high level of mathematics and physics. Simultaneously solving the conservation of energy and conservation of momentum is not a trivial task. It is actually some pretty serious math, which would require some pretty serious programming. Um, so I'm definitely willing to do something like that if there's enough interest. Uh, just let me know about it. And if anything in this tutorial confused you or you have questions or you'd like to see a follow up on anything, let me know about in the comments below as well. I will get back to you as soon as I can. I appreciate all the support on YouTube. Please don't forget to subscribe. There is a Patreon link in the description below as well. If you're feeling charitable, you wanna become a super supporter of the channel, help me grow, help me do new projects. Thank you so much for watching. If you stuck it out to the end, I don't know why I'm still rambling, but leave a like on the video. I'll see you next time. Good luck with your projects. Thanks for watching, bye.